We've arrived at what would be our 24th meeting of the year. The semester is drawing to a close, so we want to simplify as much as we safely can. We don't want to oversimplify what we do cover. As a result, we will not be able to cover all the topics touched on in the readings. The final will only cover what was discussed in class or in these videos. We begin with a look at the doctrine that applies to the use of deadly force in defense of property. This is explored in the case of People versus Sabalos. In this case, the defendant set a spring gun to protect his property. You may have read the cases of Bird versus Holbrook or Catco versus Briney in torts, torts class. Those were civil damages cases rather than criminal prosecutions, but the moral ideas are much the same. In a nutshell, the law disfavors the use of spring guns and similar types of traps. The law of deadly self-defense involves balancing the value of the actor's life and the value of the life of another whom the actor perceives to be a deadly threat. When the competing value is not another life, but mere property, the law responds differently, as we would expect and hope. Property is a lesser value. And so, in general, the use of deadly force is never justifiable merely to defend property. The owner's recourse must be to official law enforcement. This simple rule is not always easy to apply. That is because so many situations involve perceived threats to both person and property. The crime of robbery, for example, could be defined as a theft accomplished by force or threat of force to the, to the possessor. When a robbery occurs, the robbery victim typically perceives a threat to both her property and her person. Accordingly, statutory provisions to spell out the exact dimensions of the privilege to use deadly force can seem to expand the privilege. The California statute applied in Sabalos is one example. The statute reads, homicide is justifiable when committed in defense of habitation, property, or person against one who manifestly intends or endeavors by violence or surprise to commit a felony. Counsel for Sabalos points to evidence that the victim manifestly intended to commit the felony of burglary. Therefore, counsel argues, Sabalos's use of deadly force to prevent a burglary was justified under the statute. The court interprets the statutory term felony to mean some atrocious crime attempted to be committed by force. The court concedes that Burglary has been included in the list of such crimes. Things are looking good to Sabalos up to this point. But, the court continues, it cannot be said that under all circumstances, burglary constitutes a forcible and atrocious crime. The court turns aside from a categorical interpretation of the statutory term felony and continues. For example, where the character and manner of the burglary do not reasonably create a fear of great bodily harm. The justification depends on whether there was reason for the defendant to fear harm to his person. The simple rule reasserts itself. Life may never be taken in defense of mere property. And on the facts of the case, Sabalos had no reason to fear an imminent threat of serious bodily harm. He wasn't even home. What if he had been? The picture we have of a forcible entry is something like what you see here. Does the simple rule of Sabalos allow the use of deadly force? Ed evidently so. We can't safely let this guy in. But think of another situation. The simple rule does not allow the use of deadly force to stop this burglar. The character and manner do not reasonably create a fear of serious bodily harm, not at this point. Recall that producing a weapon and threatening to use it 
is not yet the use of deadly force. So Sabalos and other cases vindicate the basic rule that deadly force is never justified merely to protect property. We would expect the model penal code to endorse it as well, and indeed the relevant provisions start from that baseline. Deadly force is not justified merely to defend property. Unless. I myself see no wisdom in adding that unless. We do not have time to examine each of the exceptions the model penal code proposed, but consider this situation. Suppose a security guard detects this crime in progress. She produces her weapon and demands the thieves stop, as she must do under the model penal code when using any force to protect property unless she believes a warning would be dangerous to her or useless. The bad guys laugh and continue on their way. She fires a warning shot, but they laugh and quicken their pace. Does the model penal code authorize the use of deadly force needed to prevent these thieves from getting away? Surprisingly, and disappointingly, model penal code section 3063D says yes, if the actor believes non-deadly alternatives involve substantial danger of serious bodily harm to her, as indeed she might, since she is outnumbered. I don't want us to get a headache but look at this monstrosity carefully with me, then unsee it if you can. Protection of property. The use of deadly force is not justifiable. The MPC starts off with the basic rule, but is determined to improve on it. Unless the actor believes that, bear in mind how the MPC deals with unreasonably mistaken beliefs, the actor is convictable of manslaughter if her, if her belief is reckless or criminally negligent homicide if it is negligent. Believes what? Unless the actor believes that the person against whom the force is used is attempting to commit or consummate arson, burglary, robbery, or other felonious theft or property destruction. The actor has to believe there is felonious theft or damage to property and the victim has either employed deadly force, pause here, note the past perfect tense, the use or threat may have passed, or the use of force other than deadly force to prevent the consummation of the crime would expose the actor to substantial danger of serious bodily harm. Note, substantial danger. And this privilege applies both to prevention and consummation of the crime. So, if the victim either has threatened deadly force or the defendant's use of deadly force is believed to be the only way to stop the victim, there is a justification defense. Complicated? Consider, suppose you see a thief use a bolt cutter to make off with a bicycle that obviously does not belong to him. Under the model penal code provision under review, it doesn't matter whether it's your bike or somebody else's. Suppose this is a burly guy who ignores your hue and cry. You happen to have your scoped Remington 760-30-06 Springfield loaded and ready to go. Under the model penal code, are you allowed to take him down? There's no other way to prevent his consummating the theft. It seems to come down to whether you believe the theft is felonious or not. And this depends on the value of the thing taken. How much you think that bike is worth? Let's stipulate that in the jurisdiction, a theft is a felony only if the value of the thing exceeds $500. You say you think that bike might be worth $501? The MPC says, you may fire when ready, Gridley. This is madness. Many of you will agree with me of oh, the humanity. Query, 
What if the victim drops the bike and runs? Answer. The privilege ends. The victim is no longer attempting to consummate a felonious theft. Oh, to add another twist, deadly force is not under authorized under the model penal code if the victim is making a claim of right. Under the simple rule of Sabalos, deadly force would not be justified at all, whatever the value of the bike. Complicated rules are not always better rules. Some subtleties might be better left to the sentencing stage than packed into an already much too wordy statute.